ask the congregation uh, to keep in your prayers uh, Paul Cross. Paul Cross is, uh, you know, his husband, of, as many of you know, uh, of our longtime church hostess, uh, Laura Lee Cross, who died uh, several years ago. She was our hostess for 34 years at the church, and Paul Cross uh, is now at the uh, Good Shepherd Hospice uh, house uh, right here in Manhattan. So please um, uh, pray for his peace and his, his comfort. I understand that some of the uh, top toys on the Santa Claus wish list this season include Paw Patrol Zoomer, which is a walking, talking, interactive rescue mission pup. How about that? Uh, Hatch animals, creatures that actually hatch. And it's left for you to teach and nurture these animals to walk and talk. Then there is the Nerf and Strike Elite Drone Buster, uh, the Sky Viper Streaming Drone, which executes flips and rolls. Then there is the Power Wheels Wild Thing, complete with dual joystick controls. Then there is a Star Wars Stormtrooper with over 70 light and sound effects. Well, these toys have come a long way since the G.I. Joe truck and the our Barbie doll car I had to assemble years ago. And I should say that I always thought it was immersive, very merciful of the toy makers when they left off the words on the box, some assembly required. And for us as adults, I saw an online ad yesterday that read, the gift that will make them think of you every day, a Keurig. There you go. Now, it is the season to get all your lists together and to organize a schedule of friends and family coming and going this festive time of the year. It's also a good time to review the ways in which you and I can work on areas so common to the theme of Christmas and Advent season, the themes of peace and joy and compassion and mercy. And in many ways, the expression of mercy is magnified through the, throughout the scriptures and throughout the history of Christianity. It was a big enough theme that Jesus included it right up front in the first book and in the first gospel of the New Testament. The other day when I was going up the elevator at Via Christi Hospital, a grandmother of a newborn child was carrying an assortment of things in uh, in a baby stroller for her family. And as she was getting off uh, the elevator to go to the second floor, she said to me, have a blessed day. Her tone of voice suggesting a sincerity, and a thoughtfulness. Now, when Jesus recited his nine Beatitudes within the context of the Sermon on the Mount, he opened with the word, blessed. A different definition in the way that this grandmother had expressed it, Jesus spelling out a provocative challenge in just about every arena of life with the simple word, blessed. But you only gain that title if you do what he asks you to do. There is no free lunch for the name blessed. So when Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are those who are hunger and thirst for, right, for what is right, for they shall be satisfied. Or blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons and daughters of God. Or blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. There is, is the kingdom of heaven. He lays out a definitive criteria as to how you and I are to be judged as Christians, including blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy, which simply suggests that we are, we are to be merciful in our treatment of others. Now, if you don't do what is right, as one of the Beatitudes suggests, then you fail that part of Jesus' exam. If you don't attempt to create peace within your family or within your organization, then you become a distant relative of Christ. If your heart is not pure and your pursuit of your goals, then you have disappointed Christ. If you don't wish to endure the suffering suffering that accompanies a decision that goes against popular opinion, then you have lost that right to be called blessed. Or if you show little mercy or, or are indifferent to a need right before your very eyes, well then, you need to ask God for forgiveness 
and restitute by responding the next time. But for our purposes this morning, we concentrate on this virtue of mercy and how essential and integral it is to the practice of our faith. Mercy is talked about throughout the entire Bible. The prophet Joel in our Old Testament lesson tells us of the merciful nature of God in his words. He is gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger. He's abounding in loving kindness. These words were issued more as a threat and an enticement to the Israelites than anything else considering the fact that the prophet had predicted apocalyptic doom, a literal plague of locusts on the agricultural and economic and religious life of the Hebrew people, unless they returned, unless they returned to the loving and merciful ways of their Lord. The story of Joel is indicative of the way that God wants us to behave toward one another. If we are to be a citizen of his kingdom, then it is paramount that we demonstrate mercy and compassion to one another. If we don't weave it into the fabric of our lives, then it becomes increasingly difficult to claim the citizenship of his kingdom. Consider the demonstrations of the Lord's mercy toward us, which in turn requires us to show compassion and mercy to others if we are to glorify him. David said in 2 Samuel, his mercies are great. The psalmist said in Psalm 86, for you, God, are good, and you are ready to forgive, and you're great in mercy. Another psalmist, as Shelley read this morning, um, 145 said, the Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. He is gracious, he is merciful, he is great in loving kindness. Christ tells us in Luke 6, be therefore merciful as your Father is merciful. Paul writes in Ephesians, God who is rich in mercy. Mercy magnified. Paul also writes in Hebrews, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. There is no shortage of the emphasis in the scriptures of the indispensable virtue of mercy. You know, we have heard the parable of the Good Samaritan dozens and dozens of times, but it's probably the best illustration of mercy in the entire Bible. You know the story, of course, the unlikeliest of all characters, the Samaritan, despised and looked down upon by those who thought they were better than he, he ends up to be the one who responds to the person who finds himself in the ditch. Unlike the two presumably religious, respected folk who look the other way to avoid getting involved. There is a reason that Jesus told his parable. And there is a reason that it remains most prominent in our minds. Mercy and compassion are integral and essential in leading a good life. It's as simple as that. Now, as Christians, we take our cue from Christ, and there is an unmistakable cue of mercy and compassion that defines us as Christians. In order for me and for you to walk the talk of the Christian faith you and I must look for ways to demonstrate the mercy of Christ on a day-to-day basis. The temptation is to make excuses as to why you can't stop, why you and I can't take the time, or why we can't make the sacrifice to help make someone's life a little less difficult and therefore show a little compassion and a little mercy. You know, I have a soft spot in my heart for many of the American workers who work hard every day but earn barely enough to get by, who show up for work every day but whose paychecks hardly cover the necessities of life. A few days ago, we were in the process of moving, and I had hired a local moving company to help with the big stuff. But at the end of the day, the truck got stuck when I ran over the curb in, in my driveway, 
And once the wrecker pulled it out, the truck ran out of fuel. It was not a good day for those guys. But during this two to three hour stretch, I had a nice visit with one of the guys. He's a 26-year-old African-American, originally from St. Louis, now living in Junction City with his wife and his four kids in their apartment. As hard as this young man worked, it was evident that he and his family were under financial stress. He told me that he worked for this company for three and a half years and attended the church in Junction City, said he was tired of his pastor talking about how good the Dallas Cowboys were, and that he himself played a little arena football. The wide receiver had good speed. I said, aha, we have a race Sunday night called the Jingle Bell Run. Why don't you bring your wife and your kids, enjoy the evening with us, and I'll pay your entry fees. He responded enthusiastically. I'm still, still hoping that he and his family will make it tonight. I figured that was the least I could do. The point of the story is that, that we are not to just feel compassion and mercy for others, but to go beyond that feeling to demonstrate that compassion and mercy and do something about it. I'm certainly not always successful. I can become easily distracted when the hour has come to exhibit this virtue. Many of you, though, do it in many magnificent ways. Stories of mercy that would never be whole, heard, would never be told, but will live forever in the hearts that you touched. You know, mercy and compassion take on many different shapes and forms. It's reported that a woman and her two young children went into a jewelry store not too long ago to sell a gold ring, a gift from the woman's mother, because she desperately needed the money. There's so many people out there like that, desperately needed money to support her family. But the jeweler said to her, is this is the only reason you're selling this gift from your mom is because you have no money? The woman responded, yes, that's the reason. The man reached into his pocket and handed her a handful of cash. Here you go, he said. And by the way, here's your ring back, returning the astonished mother's cherished piece of jewelry. Write down my number, he said. If you never need anything again, don't go anywhere else, for I will buy it if you want to sell it again. You know, what makes this story even more memorable and meaningful is that the jeweler, jeweler was a refugee from war-torn Syria. Perhaps someone along his travels as a refugee showed him mercy, and now it was his turn to do the same. You know, God has shown us remarkable mercy and loving kindness. It isn't always time for us to look for ways to, to do at least a fraction of what he has done for us. You know, about four years ago, I read an obituary in the New York Times about a young man, age 19. He shared a story, I believe, a few years ago, uh, who was about to be a freshman at Gettysburg College in Pennsylvania, who was tragically killed in an automobile accident in Montana. It's interesting to read obituaries of people you don't know and to find out what's really important to them. It said that he was an honor student, a 19-year-old. He was a squash player, he was a golfer. He earned five varsity letters during his tenure in high school. He went on to say that this young man was personable, he was cheerful, and he was considerate uh, with a warm smile. But the emphasis of the obituary it seemed to be on the fact that he made sure that those around him felt loved, they felt appreciated, and that they were happy. In the end, isn't this what really matters? That those around us 
and those we don't even know, that they feel loved, appreciated, and happy. And I would add to that, respected. Jesus said, blessed are you if you are merciful. And if you are merciful, you will receive mercy. Amen.